Hi, so I'm here to talk about the future of news. And the future of anything sounds a, maybe a little bit vague, sometimes a little bit scary, but it's also quite exciting. Um, and I really want to talk about embracing changes and being fearless. Um, I work in news. I've had a, an interest in news from a, 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 ver a very young age. Um, m I remember in 1990, in the summer of 1990, being mesmerized by the World Cup, like the rest of the country. I was glued to TV watching as our football team debuted in their first ever World Cup in, in Italy. Um, it was a pretty big deal. And my brother tells the story, which he now classifies as my first reporting assignment. I sat and watched these matches with a pencil and a copy book and took notes. And after the matches were over, I would go upstairs, compile my notes and come back down to my bemused but indulgent family. And as an eight-year-old, I would give them a television stand-up report. I yeah, know, they, they really liked it. Um, so... I'm not surprised I love stories from a young age. We come from a nation of storytellers. We love news and stories. From Shanna Keys to Gay Byrne, we just love talking, sharing news, and that's backed up by fact. Ireland is some of the biggest news consumers internationally. Reuters came out last year with a report and named Ireland as one of the most digitally engaged news consumers of English-speaking nations. We consume more news on radio in Ireland than most of our other EU counterparts. 23% of Irish people classify themselves as news lovers. That's over-indexed inter internationally. And we love getting international news from, from global providers. I had the news habit of many people of my generation in the 90s. I advanced from the uh, pencil and copy book to listening to the local radio in the morning as I got ready for school. My parents bought the Irish Examiner, or at the time, the Cork Examiner. Um, and every evening, this lovely lady, lady, Anne Doyle, would tell me what was happening here in Ireland and around the world. Maybe mine was a little bit of an overdefined news habit, but it led me to a career in news. I've worked here in Dublin with RTE and News Talk, in London with the BBC, and I now work at CNN, uh, running social media uh, in the bureaus all over the world. Think about this. My job didn't exist when I did my master's here in, in DCU. I did a master's of journalism, and there were no jobs head of social media when I did that. Um, I might age myself a little bit, but my first mobile phone, and it was a Nokia phone, I got that when I went in to do my undergraduate at University College Cork, and that was the same time I used emails for the first time. But throughout my career in journalism, I've had to embrace changing technologies. Embrace them, love them, and not fear them. I went on an assignment for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation to Papua New Guinea in 2009. And at the time, radio was the king of all media in PNG. Radio was king, and it was the, the place that most people got their news for a variety of reasons. Most people in this specific island didn't own a TV. Low literacy, level meant, no, low literacy levels meant that a lot of people didn't buy newspapers. And radio was the king of all media there. But change was about to come, because not only did an Irish redhead arrive in 2009, but cheap feature phones also arrived, and they flooded the market. This is with a group of editors and journalists in the highlands of Papua New Guinea in a place called Enga. And I remember working with them on some radio documentaries and their editorial output. And watching one day as two young girls in this highland town in PNG came with a letter and put it in a box outside the station manager's office. I asked the journalists what they were doing and they explained that this is what the community did. They would write requests or they would uh, have comments and they would put it in paper form and leave it at the radio station for it to be read out loud that night. So immediately I went down to the local market and I bought a SIM card. It was about 20 kina, which is the equivalent of a couple of euro. And I took it back to the radio station. I asked every broadcaster that was on air that day to put this SIM card in their mobile phone and read out a number. That first day they got hundreds of text messages from their community. 
and it changed how they talked and communicated with their audience. It was a technology that they could have potentially feared, but they didn't. They embraced it and they thrived. I spent a lot of time in Burma, in Myanmar, between 2012 and 2014. And it was a fascinating front row seat to a whole country embracing change and new technologies. When I went in 2012, I worked with a group of 100 young journalists for the BBC. And I remember sitting, the first time I sat down with this big group of journalists, I asked them, did anybody have a mobile phone? Bear in mind, I want to paint you a picture of what Burma was like in 2012. The, the country was under a cloak of censorship. Every, they only had weekly newspapers that had to be sent to the censorship board ahead of publication to be approved. There were no ATMs when I arrived there in 2012, and mobile phones were rare, very rare. I asked this group of journalists, did anybody have a mobile phone? And one hand shot up, and this was put on the table. Nice try. It wasn't a mobile phone, but Tura, you tried your best. When I went back 18 months later, early 2014, it was a dramatically different country. Sanctions had been lifted, tourism was booming, and the censorship board had been abolished. I went back to work with daily uncensored newspapers on their social and their digital strategy. And landing in Yangon, I saw instantly that it was a different place. Everybody I met had a mobile phone. And the first thing they wanted to do when they met me was join me on Facebook. Take this gentleman. This is a monk from, a Buddhist monk from the north of the country. I met him on his first day in Yangon, ever in his whole life. He'd come from a very remote part of Burma. And the first day he got to Yangon, before he stepped foot in what you can see in the background there is the most famous Buddhist site in the world, the Shwedagon Pagoda. The first thing he did was go to the market and buy those two mobile phones that he's clutching onto for dear life. It was fascinating to see a country completely embrace change and new technologies. In every chapter of my life, in every part of my career, I've been fascinated at embracing the change of technology, and in particular how that relates to news consumption and news habits. Which brings me to my job today. I'm the Senior Director of Social News um, at CNN, um, and that means running all the social media teams around the world. Our mission statement, the mission statement of social at CNN, is creating a CNN news habit for every generation on every platform. We're invested in going to where audiences are, reaching them with some of the best storytelling in the world. And we know to be relevant, we need to go where they are. Here's just a little look of some of the places that we're publishing. We are telling different types of storytelling across all of these mediums, messaging, social media, emerging of platform, over the top broadcast, because that's where audiences are. And news habits are evolving faster than we ever, ever imagined because of things like mobile phones. We launched on messaging apps. We launched on three messaging apps in the last six months. Kick, Facebook Messenger, and Line, which is a big global messaging app. Why? Because we've noticed, again, news habits evolving. People are sh moving away from mass social sharing to peer-to-peer -peer or small group sharing, and they're doing that on messaging apps. It's almost like the modern-day version of the Shanna Keys, but instead of walking down the road to hear what the story is, we're getting news and updates on WhatsApp from friends and family. So I flew in this morning from Washington, D.C., from what's been a pretty gripping and historic um, you, uh, presidential campaign in the US. Massively consumed, not only there in the US, but here in Ireland. I remember calling my mom uh, from Miami during the primary season um, and asking her how her birthday celebrations in Brantry were. She didn't want to talk about that. She wanted to ask me why Mitt Romney had come out against Donald Trump and who put him up to that. Yes. And it's not only news organizations that are embracing new types of storytelling. The candidates are too. Here we are backstage in Las Vegas with Secretary Clinton. We had each and every one of these candidates sit down for what was originally going to be an Instagram profile, an Instagram portrait. We did it for Instagram because we wanted a different type of storytelling. The, those images, which you saw on the last slide, they have become the ubiquitous, iconic images of the US presidential campaign. This is a story for a different day. 
But this is Miami, just after I called my mom. And this is me interviewing President-elect Donald Trump in a toilet in Miami for a Snapchat interview. You're going to see that in a video in a little while. They've embraced social media, these candidates in particular. In 18 months, we have seen how important social media and messaging has been in getting or the story of the election 2016 out to audiences. Let me give you one example. This is, again, back in Vegas. This is in September at the, one of the first Republican debates. There was a lot of them on the stage, wasn't there? This broke records across TV. 23.1 million people watched this on CNN, which was, up until Tuesday, the most watched ever event of uh, CNN's television history. But it wasn't just TV where people were getting this news. Millions upon millions of people live streamed this on CNN Go, on our desktops, and on one, just one Facebook page that night, we reached 100 million people, and we had 40 million video views of debate content. The stats from this week are quite similar. We broke records across TV and digital. We also had a lot of second screen uh, Facebook experiences where we, we projected Instagram portraits on the Empire State Building. That Facebook Live was seen by 25 million people. And we reached 5 million new people on messaging apps on election night. And I'm going back to the messaging apps and I'm going to show you something. This is Kick. Kick is a US-centric messaging app that's used by 13 to 17-year-olds in the, in the US. And again, it's all back to that, creating a new CNN news habit for the next generation. We launched on Kick for the conventions in Cleveland and Philadelphia, and we went all in on election night on this platform. But we didn't do TV on Kick. That just wouldn't work. We didn't do what we would do on desktop or for our mobile apps on Kick, because again, it wouldn't work for this platform and for this audience. We told the story of election 2016 using the language that these teenagers use in the US. We launched an election sticker set. There's Wolf Blitzer. We launched emojis, and we updated a gift tray in real time as the night progressed. Why it was important for us to do that, there's no point in playing around on these platforms and looking at evolving news habits unless you're going to change the way you tell stories on them. We also have played around with VR this year. We have streamed a number of our debates in virtual reality, and they've been seen by, 70, by people in 73 countries around the world. This is a new type of storytelling, but we again embraced new types of storytelling. The story, election 2016, stayed the same, but we embraced new types of storytelling and evolving news habits across all of these different platforms. Here's a little look at all of the different generations, devices, and people that we reached using our different types of storytelling for election 2016. We're going to abolish the IRS. Public colleges and universities tuition free. Trade, we're going to make great trade deals. The election's over, though, to be honest. Um, <laughs> so, what does the future of news look like in Ireland? I don't know. What's, what are those news habits, those evolving news habits, going to look like in 5 or 10 or 15 years' time or 100 years? I can't even imagine. But what, will, what needs to happen is that news organisations here in Ireland embrace change and new technologies. Today in Ireland, TV is still the most popular way that people consume news. But that's about to change. Websites, digital websites are a close second. And I have seen 
from over in the US how good some of the social strategies of newer news organizations are here in Ireland. I get most of my Irish news from Facebook. I love what the journal.ie and joe.ie do. And my favorite, my absolute favorite, is what the satirical news site Waterford Whispers. If you haven't read it, it's bloody brilliant. I love it. Um, so what does news look like in Ireland in the, in the next 100 years? Well, what I know needs to happen is news organizations here have to be fearless in embracing change. They really, really need to know who their audiences are. And those evolving news habits are getting quicker and quicker. And they're evolving at a pace that we never imagined. They're going to have to embrace platforms. The platforms that people are getting news from messaging apps to social media to VR are changing dramatically at a much faster pace than our older institutions. Think about it. TV, yes, it's got glossier, and now we're in HD, but the format of TV hasn't changed that dramatically. Newspapers are essentially what they were decades ago. But if you look at what Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat are doing, and how it's changing every month, every year, from live streaming to messaging. That, those platforms are evolving faster than news organizations can keep up. And they need to embrace new technologies. And really not to be afraid to fail, but fail fast. Some things we do at CNN don't work, and we just stop doing them. I think, I don't know if anybody saw what um, CNN did in 2002 with a hologram of Will I Am. It didn't go down well, but we tried something new. So. What does the future of news look like? Audience behavior and evolving news habit is going to be a massive part of it. I knew as an eight-year-old doing a TV report for my family that that's how they were going to consume my story. This is my little nephew, Oliver. He's two. He swipes faster on a smartphone and an iPad than anybody I've ever seen in my life. And he also loves, because I introduced him to it, it VR. He loves consuming things on VR. And the future of news in Ireland has to include fearless embracing of new types of storytelling. The story can stay the same, pure journalism can stay the same, but the, t the ways that we tell those stories has to evolve. And media organizations and journalists here in Ireland need to be thinking about this, the next generation of Irish news consumers. Thank you. <laughs>